We now recognize the gentleman from Florida, number one, Mr. Gates. Mr. Moore, does your association of technology companies endorse the No AI Fraud Act? Uh, we have no position on it. Yeah. I, I don't know that I would. Uh, I wouldn't characterize us ex as <clears throat> exclusively an association of technology Are you, Is companies. your group supportive or not supportive of, of the No Fakes Act? We have no position on it. Do you intend to take a position on either of those bills? We're examining it. So there seem to be two key features of the, the No AI Fraud Act. One is the transferability, which we've been discussing. The other is the liability. So these technology platforms that share deep fakes, uh, Mr. Mason, do you think they should be liable for the harm uh, that that causes the creator? Definitely a complicated question. I think the liability lies across um, many layers. To me, it's people who utilize the technology inappropriately. It's people who distribute it. And it is also people who host it. So, well, right now, they have no liability for that. And that. you've endorsed a bill that would impose that liability. So you support that, right? Yes. And, and Mr. Moore, your association, how do you think about liability for the entities that, that do the harms Mr. Mason described? I think there's at, least, there's at least two issues in there. One is the liability of the person who creates it. <clears throat> the uh, mine's about the, the publication. My question directly relates to the provisions of the bill that create liability if you disseminate and produce and publish these, these deep fakes. So <clears throat> the problem that we, I think we would be looking at as we examine this is that when regulating in this space, it's very important to focus on the particular harm that Congress is looking to prevent. <clears throat> When we talk about rights of identity, there are, in general, what it does is it lumps together a bunch of different harms. There is the commercial Mr. harm. Moore, I, I have very limited time. The okay. question is, if someone disseminates deep fakes on their technology platform, should they, is it your view that they should be liable or that they should not be liable for that? I think the answer, I mean, I, for now, there's for now, our position is the current law is adequate to address So that. the current law doesn't create that liability, Ms. Wilson. And so I hear about your concerns. And if these technology companies that, are, that, that disseminate this stuff do it, they, they believe the current law should exist and there should be no enhanced liability. I look at what happened to Taylor Swift. She is the most famous person in the world. And so hmm. to me, it seems as though she's just the first wave in the set and that coming is a regime in which any prominent person could be subject to these deep fakes. And technology platforms can then generate revenue off of it and then don't want to be liable for that. Do you, does that strike you as fair? Absolutely not. And why? Um, I mean, it, it, my heart is like beating out of my chest right now even just thinking about it. Um, and just like I said earlier, um, my reputation is everything to me. and. Um, well, what about speech, right? Because I just heard Mr. Moore in his testimony say that actually when these technologies do like what we saw with Johnny Cash and Barbie Girl or perhaps even with Taylor Swift and the, the deep fake explicit videos, that that's, that could be First Amendment protected speech. Yeah. Do you think, a, do you think that, that your representatives in Congress ought to, ought to repose First Amendment speech rights on robots creating deep fakes and explicit videos? It's absolutely not. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Uh, robots should not be subject to free speech. I can't even believe I have to say that out loud. Ms. Mr. Mason, I, we've also talked about this transferability concept, and I want to push back a little bit at what I, th I thought I heard Professor Rothman say. Like, why shouldn't a prominent person or any person have the right to sell their name, image, likeness. Like if tomorrow, I'm a prominent person, if tomorrow I wanted to sell my voice to a robot and let that robot say whatever in the world it wanted to say and I wanted to take the money from that sale and go buy a sailboat and never turn on the internet again, why should I not have the right to do that? I believe you should. Right, and that's the bill you've supported creates this concept of ownership over your name, your image, your likeness, your voice. And maybe I'm just a country lawyer from North Florida, but the only way you own something is if you have the ability to enjoy the exclusive use of it and if you have the right to sell it. So if you can't sell your own voice 
Do you even really own it? And if you can't control the exclusive use of it, I don't know if you really own it. So I think this, this legislation is a good first step, and I think that the industry associations opposing it want to be able to avoid the liability, to be able to use the tech, and to be able to undermine the creative infrastructure that has allowed our country to flourish. I yield back. It wasn't a question at the end, was there? No. <laughs> I asked my questions. I got, the, I got the true answer. You got a good answer. Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Johnson for holding this field hearing. And thank you to the panelists who are here today, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Mason, Mr. Moore, and Ms. Rothman for your testimony. As a recovering computer science major, I believe AI has benefited society and will continue to benefit society. It can also be misused and cause harm. And I think what we're trying to figure out is how do we allow AI to innovate but to mitigate the harms. And uh, Mr. Mason, I'm going to ask you some questions because I want to know what the recording county's position is on some of these issues. Uh, as you know, these large language generative AI models train themselves by scraping the entire internet uh, to get data. Some of that includes copyrighted works of artists, such as, for example, Taylor Swift. Do you believe artists such as Taylor Swift should be compensated by these software companies when they use her material to train themselves? Yes, we believe that people that have spent their whole lives, like Lainey, to create art that is being used and monetized should be compensated when it is being used. Right. Yes. Let's say a person uh, who is a fan of Taylor Swift uses one of these models and generates lyrics in the style of Taylor Swift for his or her own personal enjoyment. Do you think that person has to uh, pay anything to Taylor Swift? And do you think the software that generated that has to pay anything to Taylor Swift? I think it would come down to use, what they used it for, for their personal enjoyment. Might be something to discuss, but as, as soon as they start monetizing that or trying to commercialize it, that's a different question and they should be paid. And I gather it's the same answer if the person was able to use a AI app that takes the lyrics and the style of Taylor Swift and then matches it up to a video that looks like Taylor Swift and audio that sounds like her. Same answer, right? It depends on what they use that for. If it's for their own personal enjoyment, maybe it's fair use, but if they try to sell it, it, it wouldn't be, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Moore, I'm going to ask you sort of the same questions. Do you believe AI models that scrape copyrighted material to train themselves need to pay the people who own this copyrighted material? Uh, our our position is that those are going to be fact-dependent. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, our position is that those are fact-dependent inquiries that are going to be handled.